Hello, James Flotten here with the Minnesota Space Grant Consortium. I'd like to talk for a few minutes about calculations of stability as it applies to rocketry. So um, here are some slides. I'm gonna do this in three parts. The first part will be looking at the slides. The second part will be doing a hand calculation using some of the equations in the slides. The third part will actually be doing the same calculation using an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I think this is valuable, but the good news is if you use rocket simulation programs like Open Rocket or RockSim, they will do these calculations for you. So this is sort of instructive in what's behind the calculations. Let's get started. For rocket stability, you're most interested in the center of gravity, sometimes called the center of mass, and the center of pressure for a rocket. And if you can figure out where both of those are located, typically with respect to the tip of the nose cone, so we'll usually measure down from the tip of the nose cone, um, you can then generate a static margin, where the static margin is how far apart are those two locations in the rocket in terms of diameters of the rocket. And as long as the static margin is positive, the rocket will be considered stable, if it's negative, it's unstable. If it's between zero and one, it is positive, but that's considered marginally stable. And if it's greater than one, it will be considered stable. This is based on the Barrowman Report from 1966. I encourage you to take a look at that if you'd like. So CG, center of gravity. This is the average location of the gravitational forces on the rocket. And so presumably each piece of the rocket has a weight and so Gravity acts on each piece, that's true, but you can figure out where on average the gravitational force acts, and then that force acting would be on the total weight of the rocket. So you'll add up all the weights to get the total weight and figure out how to weight those values, uh, the individual values, to find the location of the center of gravity. This is actually easy to do experimentally. If you have a small rocket, you can just balance it on your finger and see the point about which it balances would be the center of gravity. These slides will help you figure out how to calculate the location of the center of gravity. This is important because as a rocket travels and is not like sitting on the ground, um, it will tend to wobble about the center of gravity based on the forces that act upon it. So the key is to get the air forces, which will act at the center of pressure to act below or behind or aft of the center of gravity so that the rocket tends to fly nose first. It tends to stabilize itself as it travels forward. So here's a picture that shows the center of gravity for three different parts of a very simple rocket. It has a nose cone on the right, a body in the middle, fins on the left. Each of them has a weight. In this case, perhaps the nose cone is not too heavy, so its gravitational vector is small. The fins are maybe very heavy. And so the average location for the total weight of the rocket perhaps would be a little bit towards the fins in this particular situation. That would be the center of gravity for the rocket as a whole. Center of pressure, on the other hand, is a related concept. This is the average location where the wind forces act on the rocket. So if you think about a, a weather vane, for instance, on top of a, a farmhouse, um, it's supposed to twist so that it points into the wind. So apparently wind blowing on it will push on different parts of the weather vane. And typically a weather vane will have things, maybe they won't look like fins, but they might, um, on one end so that that end is more susceptible to the wind and that end has a tendency to shift downwind as the thing rotates about the location where it's pivoted, okay? So in particular for rocketry, we realize there's going to be significant forces from the wind due to your motion through the air. So those will be forces along the length of the rocket. Pretty much I'm going to ignore those. I'm mostly only interested in the sideways forces. Those are called the perpendicular forces or the normal forces. So we're looking for the normal forces on the rocket associated with wind. And in this case, it's not the wind flowing with respect to the earth. It's what the, the rocket sees. And if the rocket is moving quickly through the air, the rocket will see a lot of oncoming wind. And if the rocket happens to be tipped a little bit sideways, some of that oncoming wind will have a tendency to push the rocket sideways. That's what we're most anxious to identify and find out what is the average location of the wind forces acting on the rocket. So for instance, here's a figure from the Behrman paper. It talks about the airflow 
And in this case, the rocket is moving vertically. But notice the rocket is tipped a little bit. So the rocket is not facing vertically, it's just moving vertically. And if the rocket were to be slightly tipped over, what happens next? And the answer is the air flow, the sideways forces of it are heavily influenced by the presence of the fins, somewhat influenced by the body and the nose cone. And so the center of pressure, the average location for the air forces will be fairly close to the fins. And the center of gravity hopefully will be farther forward than that. So as the air pushes on the rocket, it will push at the center of pressure on average, and that will have a tendency to swing the rocket so it, its nose goes to the left in this figure. And that's good because right now the nose is deviated to the right, and I want the nose to go to the left, which will make the rocket fly straighter. As in, the rocket is moving vertically, and I would like the nose to be leading the way. So the key here is to get the center of pressure to be aft of or behind or below the center of gravity so that when you have wind, when you have these sideways forces due to wind, they will have a tendency to get the rocket tipped back in the right orientation, pointing in the direction it's actually traveling. The deviation from the direction between how you're pointing and how you're traveling is referred to as pitch angle. And so I'm trying to fix the pitch angle if it gets off of zero in this case is what I'm aiming for, the thing looking straight up as it's moving straight up. Static margin now will be just a way to look at the two numbers, the center of gravity number, it's a distance, and the center of pressure number, it's also a distance. Notice how far apart they are. Take the difference, in fact, between the two and then measure that in units of diameters of the rocket. So that, for instance, a static margin of one would be, or one caliper, would be the distance between the center of pressure and center of gravity is one diameter of the rocket with the center of pressure being behind. On the other hand, a negative one value for static margin, margin means the static margin <laughs> means the center of pressure is forward of the center of gravity. That would be an unstable situation. So for instance, here's a rocket which happens to have several diameters. So we're definitely going to use the biggest of the diameters. It has the center of gravity marked and the center of pressure marked, and there is a distance between them. And the center of or the static margin calculation is simply XCP, that's the distance from the tip of the nose to the center of pressure, minus XCG, that's the distance from the center of pressure to the center, uh, sorry, that's the distance from the tip of the nose to the center of gravity. And then I'll take that subtraction, which is a distance, and divide it by the diameter, which gives me a unitless number, but that unitless number will tell me how many diameters forward is CG from CP. And I'm hoping that that is at least some, and preferably one, preferably one or more. There are ways to locate the CG experimentally. You can balance the rocket, you can hang the rocket, but the bigger the rocket gets, the more of a nuisance it is to actually do this measurement. And it turns out we often want to know the answer before we build the rocket, just to make sure the rocket is likely to be healthy. So it's handy to have a way to calculate CG even before the rocket has been constructed using the location, the planned locations of all the parts and their weights. Um, Roxim Open Rocket will calculate this for us. CP, well, it turns out that, well, CG is related to the pieces in the rocket, the masses of all of which, so some of them could be buried. CP is different. CP is only the external pieces of the rocket, the things that feel the wind, okay? And so it doesn't matter if the rocket is heavy or light or hollow or solid, as long as it has a specific shape that will have a specific center of pressure location. And if you want to actually measure that, you have to somehow be able to measure forces of wind. So that means put the thing into a windy condition, perhaps some sort of a wind tunnel, and notice how the wind, as it is tipped, for instance, tends to push on it. Again, we're looking for the sideways forces. So if it's pointing straight into the wind, exactly in the wind tunnel, you might not necessarily be able to monitor or determine the location of the CP. It's only when it's slightly off of the direction of the wind that you start to get normal forces and you start to sideways forces and you start to be able to measure where those are on average located. Here's some things that might occur in a rocket. You could have a nose, you could have one or more cylindrical bodies. If they're not all the same diameter, they might have to have some shoulders that go from small to large or some boat tails that go from large to small. Um, and then presumably you will have fins typically toward the base of the rocket, okay? It turns out that when you have a conical shoulder that opens up, in other words, it's narrower at the top and it gets bigger, that will produce a sideways force 
in one direction, to the right in the next figure, actually. And if it's a boat tail where it's going from wider to narrower, it'll actually produce a force, sideways force in the opposite direction. So once in a while, the effect of a certain piece will be negative and will actually decrease the answer. For the calculations I'm going to show, all of our values will be positive. We won't actually calculate with any boat tails. So here's the, the setup of the variables. Basically, we're going to make all measurements from the tip of the nose cone. And so if I have a part, for instance, the nose cone itself, it touches the tip. So it's not offset at all from the tip, from the zero point on my measurement, but there is a location within the nose cone, which would be the center of gravity of the nose cone and also the center of pressure of the nose cone. They might be different locations. Okay, so I'll call that the offset. That's the, the distance from the top of the part to the thing in question. So there's an offset for center of gravity. There's an offset for uh, normal force for air forces. And then if you have another part, like a fins or body or whatever, if you want to figure out the location of the center of gravity for fins, for instance, you need to figure out how far are the fins from the zero line and then add the offset. So you'll calculate the offset, but then you have to figure out based on a picture like this, how far that value is from the zero line in the first place. So it's always a good idea to have a drawing just to keep your act together here, just to keep your wits about you. So for instance, in this particular case, um, we would have these two sections of, uh, uh, of the cylindrical tubing, and then there's the shoulder, and then there's the boat tail, and those things, notice the direction of the vector showing the sideways forces is to the right for the sections like the nose, nose cone and the fins, but it's actually to the left for the boat tail. So we'll watch out for that. Um, oddly enough, they don't draw any sideways forces on the cylindrical sections. And the reason for that is as long as the angles are reasonably small, those kind of shapes don't produce sideways forces. <clears throat> From Barrowman's um, paper, here are the suggestions of when you can do the calculations he proposes. First of all, the angle of attack, that's that dis that <laughs> heel between going straight up, uh, or the thing is tipped with respect to moving straight up and tipped over the angle of attack, as long as that's a reasonably small number, maybe 10 degrees, hopefully even less than that. You're not traveling uh, more than the speed of sound. The airflow is basically smooth over the rocket. It's a kind of a long, skinny rocket. That's usually true. Um, the nose cone comes to some sort of a point at the top smoothly. It's basically a symmetric object. And the fins are flat plates. All of these things are typically true for a fairly standard rocket. Although one could imagine having a fin that is you know, some sort of an airfoil shape. But uh, most of the rockets that we build, all the rockets that we build um, have flat plate fins. So as long as these are true, and these are not particularly hard for us to abide by, the following calculations should work. So on the left-hand side here, I have a distance to the center of gravity of the nose cone. And then that's called delta x. That's an offset. That's how far is the center of gravity from the tip of the part which is the tip of the rocket. Okay, so XCG, delta XCG, N, where N here means nose cone. And then I have the body. So B stands for body. So notice underneath uh, the, on the far left, there's delta XCG B. So that is uh, the offset to get to the center of mass of the body tube. Okay. But it turns out that if I want to measure all the way back to the zero point, this is called the station. So the station for the body tube is delta XCG for the body plus XB, where XB on the right-hand side of that same figure is, how far is it from the zero line to the beginning of the body? For the fins, there's an offset for the fins, and there's XF. XF is how far is it from the zero line all the way down to the beginning of the fins? So we have these offsets, delta X, and we have the station, which is adding how far to get to the part plus the offset. The things on the right-hand side are similar for CP. So there's a distance to the CP from the top of each part, and then there's a distance to each part, which of course will be the same as for CG. The body starts at the same location for both calculations. The fins start at the same location. Here then is the calculation, and it turns out this is a bit of a nuisance. It's not hard, but it's a bit tedious. We'll do it by hand, and then we'll do it with Excel. Using an Excel spreadsheet makes a lot of sense to keep track of all the things you want here. So here are the steps for CG, calculating the center of gravity. 
list the mass of every component, including the things that are inside the rocket and not visible, okay? Calculate the CG station for each component separately. So that will be called X, X bar, I guess. X bar CG for I, where I is the location. I just refers to the I part. So this will be the location of the center of gravity for each part with respect to the tip of the nose cone. Add up all the masses to get mass total. And then do the following. Add up the station times the mass for each part. So the nose cone station times the nose cone mass plus the body station times the body mass plus the fin station times the fin mass. Okay, so add up all of those. And that should equal the value of the average center of gravity times the total mass. So once you have that addition, all you just do is divide by the total mass and you will end up with the answer, which is the average CG for the entire object. Center of pressure is very, very much the same. You'll have some sort of a force coefficient, a normal force coefficient, CN, okay? And we're only dealing with the exposed components. So if there's a parachute inside of the rocket or a motor inside of the rocket, it won't come into this calculation at all. The center of gravity may well have more parts in the calculation than the center of pressure. But you wanna calculate the CP station for each piece of the rocket that's exposed as measured from the tip of the nose cone. And then you want to add up all the normal coefficients to get a total normal coefficient. And then you want to do the sum of the product of the CP station times the coefficients. So this is very similar to the previous calculation, which was the sum of the CG station times the mass. In this case, it's the CP station times the coefficient. And that sum will give you the same thing as the average CP, the final center of pressure location for the entire body, times the total normal coefficient. So if I have that sum and divide by the total normal coefficient, I will end up with calculated CP, the average CP for the entire rocket. Okay, let's just take a quick look at how this might be done. Um, and then we'll do a calculation in the next video. So first of all, here is evidence that the cylindrical bodies don't make much of a difference as far as normal coefficients. If I look at the normal force on a cylindrical body as it tips away and farther and farther and farther away from being in line with the airflow, notice that it doesn't even come off zero until you're at about 10 degrees. And it, it does grow after that. But as long as the angle of attack, the angle that you're off of pointing in the direction that you're traveling is less than 10 degrees, small angles, we don't even have to worry about the cylindrical pieces. Here is a cylindrical piece, as you might expect, the location of the center of gravity of the cylindrical piece is halfway down the piece. So delta X CG is one half of L, where L is the length of the piece. The piece, of course, has a radius and a diameter, R and D, respectively. The location of the center of pressure is also halfway down, but since the normal component, the normal component uh, force, force coefficient will be zero, I won't, in fact, make use of the fact that the CP is halfway down because it's going to drop out of the calculation anyway. Okay. Nose cones. Basically, there are tables. So here is a conical nose cone, a nose cone that's just a cone. It has a length L. It has a diameter across the bottom D. I guess that's not labeled in this figure. Um, and then there's a distance from the tip of the nose cone down to the location of the center of gravity. And it turns out that's three quarters of the length. For a conical nose cone. And then there's an offset for the location of the center of pressure partway down the nose cone, and that happens to be two thirds of L. We're not calculating that, we're just using that based on experimental evidence. So these are things you look up essentially. What is the offset for this shape of nose cone? Okay, and the answer is it's three quarters L for center of gravity, two thirds L for center of pressure, and very important, the coefficient for the sideways air forces for a nose cone of this shape is two. Here's another fairly standard nose cone, okay? This is called ogive or a tangent ogive. It's a fraction of a circle. So if you chop off a piece of a circle and then paste a couple of them together, you'll get this nose cone that has a length L. And it turns out that the center of gravity for such a nose cone is 0.685 L down from the tip. And the center of pressure is 0.466 L down from the tip. So in other words, the center of pressure is farther forward 
than the center of gravity. So if you flew just the nose cone by itself, it would be unstable. But we're not going to do that. And then the normal coefficient is also two for this particular nose cone shape. The last equations I'll show are for fins. There are lots of different fin shapes, but clipped delta fins are fairly standard. So they have a root on the left, they have a, a tip on the right, and then they have a, some sort of a sweep angle, okay? So in this particular case, looking at the right-hand side, I'm going to call the length of the root of the fin A, the length of the tip of the fin B, the height of the fin as it sits off the body will be called S, and M will be used to indicate how far the leading edge of the root is forward of the leading edge of the tip. So M is called the sweep. L is geometrically just the distance from the center of the root to the center of the tip. And then this will presumably sit on a body. So the body has a radius or a diameter, R and D respectively. And so here's how to calculate CG. B squared plus two thirds M squared plus two MB divided by two B plus M. I'm not deriving that. I'm just going to take that. Basically that's in the literature. That's the offset of the location of the center of gravity with respect to the leading edge of the fin. On the other hand, the offset of the center of pressure with respect to the leading edge of the fin is an even more complicated equation. Let's go to the next slide and see a couple more equations. Um, we'll also use the word N, uh, sorry, the, the letter N to characterize the number of fins. So you might have N is three, three fins, N is five, five fins, etc. cetera. Um, for three or four fins, for instance, um, we'll apply this to five fins as well, perhaps. Here's how to calculate the normal coefficient. It's related to N, the number of fins. It's related to S, that's the height the fin sits off the body. It's related to D. So in this particular case, D refers to, what does D refer to? D refers, I suspect, to the diameter, uh, the diameter of the airframe, okay? And uh, L, like I said before, L refers to the length of the midline of the fin from the center of the root to the center of the tip. And it turns out that a fin is more effective if it's farther from the center line of the rocket. So the, the bigger the body of the rocket, even the same fin will become more and more effective. And so in this case, if we take that value for the coefficient, okay, the normal coefficient, we actually want to adjust it. We want to multiply it by a number greater than one to compensate for the fact that it's even more effective than you expect. So this is called the body interference factor K. And ultimately the normal coefficient we use will be K times the original calculated normal coefficient. Okay, so um, at the bottom it says K is to be calculated as one plus a number and that number will be making the value bigger than one. And the number is very simple. It's just R, the radius of the rocket divided by S plus R, which is how far the tip is all the way to the center of the rocket. So you're just trying to say, I want to compensate for the fact that the fin sticks out from a rocket, that makes it more and more effective. So now that we have all of these values, normal coefficients, um, and then locations based on the drawing, we can go ahead and calculate the center of gravity overall, the center of pressure overall, and then take the difference between the two, divide by the diameter of the rocket, and get the static margin. So let's proceed on to the second part of this video series and uh, see a calculation of this sort in action.